welcome to students. So, today we will be looking into a special kind of shift space which is called subshift of finite type. Now, subshift of finite type is something which can be seen as like many dynamical systems can be seen as subshift of finite type. So, they can be characterized as subshift of finite type. These dynamical systems consist of maybe you have piecewise linear maps on an interval or you have some kind of maps some kind of smooth maps that means we are looking into differentiable maps on differentiable manifolds. So, we recall what we did last time. So, last time we had seen is that you have x sigma to be a shift space and we had studied that L x is something which we denote as the language of x. This is all the permissible blocks right coming up in sequences of x and then we had seen that x can be written as x L x complement that means, the language is good enough to specify what shift space it is, where your language x complement is basically the set of all forbidden words. Forbidden words in x we can say. Okay. So, we take up this definition now. So, a subshift of finite type which basically we can also denote it as SFT is a subshift, it is a shift space that can be described by a finite set of forbidden words. That means, my subshift of finite type is that particular shift space, where this is where the forbidden words is finite. Now, one can think of this part. So, this is basically our subshift of finite type. See what happens is if I have forbidden a word w, then any word for which w happens to be a sub word is also forbidden because w cannot come up. So, as such if we try to look into in any shift space if we try to look into what are all the words that are forbidden right other than the full shift there can be infinitely many words, but not all words, but what we need is we need a finite description of the forbidden words and that is what subshift of finite type is. Subshift of finite type does not mean that actually the words which are forbidden are finite because any word which contains that word as a sub word is also forbidden. So, as such there are infinitely many words, but our description of f happens to be finite. So, basically that gives us a very easy description of what are all the forbidden words. So, that is what is subshift of finite type. Now, going back a little bit into history, practically the sub study of subshift of finite type was first done by Perry and he actually had called them
intrinsic Markov chains These subshift of finite type are also sometimes called topological Markov chains. So, he had studied this in terms of Markov chains and he had coined, he had looked the first systematic study was done by Perry. Of course, the existence of it was known even before that and we are not sure about since when it started, but the first systematic study was done by Perry in terms when he studied piecewise linear maps on intervals where he called them intrinsic Markov chains and he studied subshift of finite type. But the term subshift of finite type was actually coined by Smale. We have already seen the Smale's horseshoe. So, it was in a study of differentiable dynamics, a celebrated paper there where he coined this word and he showed that they are a very neat machinery. to study differentiable dynamics. As we have seen that differentiable dynamics also happens to be a part of considering dynamical systems and we are not going to study differentiable dynamics in greater details in this particular course, but what he could, what Smale could realize is that this is something which is underlying in any nice, very nice kind of smooth map that you can think of and he coined the word subshift of finite type. So, let us try to look into some examples here. We will look into the first example here. And I think we all know this example very well. So, the golden mean shift is a subshift of finite type, where we know that the forbidden words are just the block 1 1, right. We can describe the forbidden word by just the block 1 1. So, this is a subshift of finite type. The other example one can think of is the full shift. On any alphabet A, Now, if you look into that part, right, we know that in this particular case, the forbidden words is an empty set. So, this is a, these are also trivially subshift of finite type, but there is more interesting stuff to this part and a very nice observation is something which we can see. So, you start with subshift of finite type, right. So, we know that x is x f with mod f finite. Now, since we have finitely many words in f, we know that all these words will have some length, right. So, let n be the maximum length of any word in f. Now, think of that. We are looking into one word which has length n and f has finitely many words. So, we can always extend the words of f to a word which has length n. So, if let f n
that has as a sub word a word in f. So, we are extending every word in f to a word of length n and we call that new collection to be f n. Now, think of that this f n will also be finite. Right? So, if I consist consider a subshift of finite type generated by f n right this will be same as the subshift of fin finite type generated by f and the simple reason for this will be the languages of both will be same if the languages are same we have the same shift space. So, these are the two things. So, these two are equal and now we can say what happens now in this particular case is that we can specify what is your x. So, your x belongs to x which is same as x f if and only if you consider this block x i i plus n minus 1 and we see that this is basically a block of length n in x right and this is true for every i in z. So, you start with that. So, what you are looking into is you have per perhaps made a window of length n and you are tracing this window. So, you are actually moving this window, you are tracing this sequence right with this window of length n and you say that okay fine this sequence is in x if and only if you can see that all this uh, all elements in this win window right they are basically blocks of length n in x and conversely if you can see that everything is there in the uh, everything like whatever the window specifies right the block that the window specifies when you move when you trace the window across the sequence if that is in the allowed blocks then that sequence would be definitely a point in x. So, you can specify x by looking into just one window. Now, we note here something else here. We note that for what happens for the even shift your f happens to be 1 0 to the power 2 n plus 1 1 such that n belongs to n union 0. Now, try to look into this f right there is no n for which I can write my x f as x of f n. So, there exists no n or I should say n capital N in n such that x f is x of f n and hence the even shift is not a subshift of finite type. Now, let us look into some definition here. This is again an important combinatorial aspect of the subshift of finite type. So, shift of finite type a subshift of finite type is called m step if it can be described by a collection of forbidden words of length m plus 1. So, supposing your forbidden words right have length m plus 1 then we say that the shift is basically m step. Now, this m step happens to be very important aspect in trying to look into some more combinatorial aspects here. But let us look into the fact that if a subshift of finite type is m step then it is also m plus 1 step right it is also m plus 2 step. 
and so it is k step for every k greater than equal to m. So, let us look into the example of the full shift. What can you say about the full shift? What is a full shift? Forbidden words are empty. So, I can describe the forbidden words in, in terms of length 1, I can dis describe the forbidden words in terms of length 2, I can describe the forbidden words in terms of length 3, right. So, the full shift is k step, right. For all k greater than equal to 0, can be described in any possible way. So, full shift is a very special kind of subshift of finite type. So, let us take down this theorem now. A shift space, so now we are starting with any shift space x is an m step. subshift of finite type, if and only if whenever I have this blocks u v and this block v w, whenever these two blocks are in L x language of x and the length of v is greater than m, then u v w this entire block will also be in the language of x. So, we say that a, sub, a shift space any shift space is an m step uh, subshift of finite type if whenever you have two blocks. So, I have basically block u and block v. So, I have words u v and w in the language and my v has length greater than m and when I am combining these two words u and v and v and w these two are also there in the language. What happens is then we can glue all the three words u v w and that word will also be there in the language. So, this is one of the properties of subshift of finite type, but it is also one of the defining characteristics of subshift of finite type which is m step. So, let us look into the proof of this. So, we look into the fact that this is less this is greater than we can think of this to be greater than equal to m no problem in taking v to be equal to m. So, we can take this to be greater than equal to m and I think it should be ok it should be just greater than m because we are talking of m shift. So, it should be m plus 1 so greater than equal to m plus 1 you can think of that part. So, v is greater than equal to m plus 1 and what you have here is that u v and v w these are in the language of x. x is m step now what is the meaning of x being m step is that the forbidden words are only given in terms of words of length m plus 1, but here we know that v u v is not forbidden, v w is also not forbidden. So, when I take the word v u v w right that word also cannot be forbidden because the forbidden words will only have length right will have length something less than m plus 1 right here you can specify that by m plus 1. So, if I take this word u v w this word will also, so you take any m plus 1 block here that block will always be permissible block right, it will never be a forbidden block and so this belongs to your language of x. So, if you have a shift space which is m step, m step subshift of finite type then this property holds. Conversely, we let m be such that is in language of x 
and your mod of v is greater than or equal to m plus 1. Then is in the language of x. Supposing this property holds true, where I am taking m to be that particular value for which this happens. Now, we take f to be the collection of all blocks of length m plus 1, which are not in b m plus 1. So, let f be the collection of all words or I should say all blocks which are not there which are not there in B m plus 1 of x. So, we are collecting all those blocks. So, we, we have specified that m is such a number for which this property holds true. We go to all the permissible blocks of length m plus 1. And then we try to see what are all the blocks of m length m plus 1 which are not there in this particular collection and that collection is something which we call as f. Then one thing is very clear that x will always be a subset of the shift space given by this forbidden block f. So, by this set f right because all the words of length m plus 1 right which are forbidden come up over here. So, x is definitely a subset of this part. On the other hand, let x belongs to x f, then we know that if I take x from 0 to m, now this is a word of length m plus 1. So, this word and if I take this x from 1 to m plus 1, right, these two words are of words of length m plus 1. So, these words are definitely in L x, these are permissible m plus 1 blocks there. Now, by using that property which means that we can say that if you take x from 0 to m plus 1, right. So, we are combining these two words, if you take this word from 0 to m plus 1, then this also belongs to L x. So, that means, we are starting with permissible m plus 1 blocks and using this permissible m plus blocks, we can generate the whole x. So, this belongs to the language of x. So, you start with any point of x f, you find that the block of length m plus 1 is in the language of x. That means, the language of x f is same as the language of x or it is contained in the language of x in that sense, right. So, we have x f is sorry this is a subset here. So, we have x f is a subset of x and combining these two we can say that x is same as x f and we note a simple result here. A shift space that is conjugate to a subshift of finite type is also a subshift of finite type. Why do we have this part? So, let us look into the fact that your x and y are two shift spaces and there is a conjugacy here. So, I have a conjugacy phi here and my x is a subshift of finite type. We can say that x is a subshift of phi is an m step subshift of finite type. So, I can say that this is my m step subshift of finite type. Now, 
since we have a conjugacy here, we can think of for every x here, there is a unique y here and then when I write the sequence x here, I can write the sequence in terms of words here. So, supposing this is my sequence x here and supposing this is a sequence y here, then we know that this particular phi because this is a conjugacy, right. So, phi happens to be a mapping which is induced by a block map. So, there will be a block map here, right, corresponding to phi there will be a block map such that you start with any word v here. What you get is that this is basically mapped to the word, right, which I can say as phi of v here. So, this block is always mapped into this block, right. And correspondingly, since this is a synchronous action, the action of a block map is synchronous, you can find that every word in that fence can be gives a word here, right, of the same name of, of course, defined by the block map f. So, depending on what is the memory and what is the anticipation. So, if this is m step, that means I just have to trace this by a window of length m, right, to know whether this is a sequence there. Similarly, because this length m would give me some other length n here, all we need to do is just trace this by a window and this is a homeomorphism. So, all I need to do here is just trace this by a window of length n to see that this particular word exists. So, if my x is m step, we can say that there is an n such that y is n step. And so, any shift which is conjugate to a subshift of finite type is itself a subshift of finite type. We will later look into the fact that this is in general not true for factors, but maybe that would be later. Right now, let us recall some other results which perhaps you would have studied in some different contacts. So, we recall here a finite graph G which is basically written as a pair V and E. A finite graph G is basically a pair V and E, where V is the finite set of vertices and E is the finite set of edges. So, we are talking of a graph G and we will be more interested in a directed graph because we would like to see what happens to whenever we talk of an edge, the edge should have some kind of an initial vertex and some kind of a terminal vertex. So, we are always interested in this directed graph G. So, our G here is a directed graph and what we find here is that for vertices, supposing I have this vertices A, I and J, right, in V, then we look into this number A i j, right. This is the number of edges with the initial vertex terminal vertex S G. Then we say that this graph G has an, then the graph G adjacency matrix, you can call it A which is given by A i j right for all i j. So, let us look into this simple graph here. So, I have this vertex i 
and I have this vertex j. And for this vertex i and vertex j, I have these edges. So, I have one edge here. I have two edges in this manner. and I have three edges here. Then corresponding adjacency matrix can be given in terms of, I write it as A g, right? I can write this as A g, right? which is respect to this is my graph g basically. So, this matrix becomes a 2 by 2 matrix and I know that from I going to itself, how many vertices, how many edges are there? So, there are three vertices edges here from i going to j there is 1, from j going to i there are 2 and from j going to itself there are 0. So, this gives my adjacency matrix. On the other hand, so I will come back to this figure again. If A R cross R is any matrix, with non negative entries, then there is a corresponding graph G. which I can call as G A with R vertices. So, let me call those R vertices to be say 1 up to R and such that. So, these vertices are such that each a i j okay, gives the number of edges from the vertex i to the vertex j. So, from a graph we can generate a matrix and from a matrix we can generate a graph. Now, another aspect which you can see in terms of this graph. So, for example, if I have this to be my matrix, then this will definitely generate this graph. So, a graph and matrix in that terms are identical because one can always be used to define the other. right? So, let us observe two things here is what happens in a graph G. So, suppose G is a graph with adjacency matrix A and say m is greater than or equal to 0. Then if I look into A i j to the power m, so that gives me the number of paths of length m from vertex i to vertex j and the trace of a to the power m gives the number of cycles m cycles 
in G. What we want to say here is that supposing this is a graph, this is the adjacency matrix. Now, we pick up two vertices. So, here we anyway have two, let us pick up i equal to i and j equal to i also. Then a i j to the power m gives me how many edges will be there, right? Starting from i of length m coming up to j. So, a i j to the power m. So, now we are looking into supposing I am looking into this square, right? So, this square will be equal to, yes, what is the first entry here a 1 1 square, what is a 1 1 square here 11 right. So, that means, if I am looking into how many edges will of length 2, how many uh, what to say what is the path of length 2 right starting from this vertex i and coming back to this vertex i it should be 11. How it can take this path, then it can take this path that is one option, it can take this path and it can take this option second it can traverse around itself third, right. Again you can think of that it can take the second path and it can then take the first path, right. So, if you count that, that total happens to be 11, which actually can be given in terms of just square the matrix, right and you get what is the entry there. On the other hand, I want to know how many cycles are there. So, cycles by cycle I mean I am starting with the same vertex and coming back to the same vertex in m step. So, supposing we want to look into how many cycles are there, all you need to do is look into the trace of a to the power m, because if you look into the trace of a to the power m, you know what, what happens here is, this gives me the number of cycles which start at one vertex and come back to itself, this gives me the number of m cycles which start at vertex 2 and come back to itself. So, if I look into the trace, we get the m cycles here. Now, let us try to exploit this particular property of the graph here to make another definition. So, we start with this definition. Let G be a graph with adjacency matrix A, then the edge shift which we define it as x g or we can say that it is x A right, is the shift space. over the alphabet set E given by the terminal vertex of x i should be the initial vertex of x i plus 1, because every edge will have a terminal vertex and an initial vertex. So, we start with the terminal vertex x i. So, wherever x i ends, right, wherever the edge x i ends, the edge x i plus 1 should start from there. So, that gives us a shift space. So, the graph generates a shift space right and this shift space is something which we call as the edge shift. Now, note what is the meaning of edge shift is we are looking into all the sequences or basically we are looking into all bi infinite paths or bi infinite walk on the graph G. So, you are just walking on the graph G and any bi infinite walk on the graph G right generates this kind of edge shift. So, what we have here is that x G gives A bi infinite walk
we start with the theorem here. Let G be a finite graph. And this x is the shift space generated by this graph G. So, this is an edge shift. then your x g is a one step subshift of finite type. So, you have an edge shift and the edge shift is basically a one step subshift of finite type. Now, here we can simply note that if you start with this collection f, right, which is the set of all words of the form a b, where your a and b are basically edges, right, such that the terminal vertex of a is not equal to the initial vertex of b. So, we are collecting all such words a b, right, such that the terminal vertex of A is not the initial vertex of B. So, all this A B will be forbidden, you cannot have any walk, right? Basically, first A and then B, it is not possible. So, this will be forbidden, and this forbidden block will be finite, right? So, the edge shift that you generate will be a one step subshift of finite time. So, any edge shift is a one step subshift of finite type. Let us try to look into some examples here. So, we look into examples here. So, let me take A to be a very trivial kind of matrix. This is the matrix K, 1 cross 1 matrix K. What does that mean? How many vertex will it have? If I look into a graph generated by A, how many vertex will it have? it will have a one vertex. So, I can say that this is one vertex here and how many edges will be there here? K edges right from the same vertex to itself. I have K edges here. And now, if I look into naming each vertex, right, because this each of these edges will be different, right. So, I should name each edge, right, there will be finitely many of them. So, I can name this one, this as 0, this as 1, and this as k minus 1. So, what is the edge shift that it is going to generate? What is your xg going to be equal to? What will be your xg here? it will be the full k shift. All permissible words are possible, right? everything is possible, there is nothing. The basically your forbidden block is empty set, right? nothing is forbidden here. So, this is the full k shift, right? shift on k letters because I am taking, I could take this names to be anything. right? So, this is the full k shift. The other example we can think of is, let A be equal to, I am taking this matrix 1, 1, 1, 0. Now, I know that here we will have two vertices. So, we have two vertices here. I have one edge going from the first vertex to itself. I have one edge going from the first vertex to the second vertex and I have one edge going from the second vertex to the first vertex and I do not have any vertex going from and uh, sorry no edge going from the second vertex to itself. So, that means I can name this right. So, maybe I call it A, I call it B, I call it C right. So, there are three edges here and now I can say that this specifies a subshift of finite type, this specifies an edge shift right for which what are your forbidden blocks? 
So, think of that after a b comes up right. So, a b is permissible, right? but after a c cannot come up right. So, a c is forbidden here. What next is forbidden? After a a always comes, so a is not forbidden here. But look into this b part after b c comes, right? So b a is forbidden here. So this is forbidden. After b c comes, but b does not come. So again b b is forbidden. And again look into c after c both a can come and b can come, right? But after c c cannot come up. So c c is forbidden. So, this matrix gives us an edge shift right for which these are the forbidden. So, I get a one step shift here right the edge shift such that these are the forbidden blocks. We note here that every edge shift is a sub shift of finite type. Can we say about what can we say about the converse part? Can we say that every sub shift of finite type is an edge shift? So, we note that Every subshift of finite type is not an edge shift and the trivial example that we can think of here is let us look into this example of the golden mean shift. So, I am looking into this golden mean shift where my forbidden block is 1 1. Now, this is a one step shift. So, one can think of ok fine this could be an edge shift, but think of this factor. Supposing I say that this is an edge shift then it should there should it should be having some graphical representation. That means that I should be having some number of vertices and some number of edges. Now, number of edges here are only 2 because my alphabet set is just 0 and 1. So, this is the only alphabet set here. So, number of edges we know that only 2. How many vertices are there that is a question here. So, if we try to look into the number of vertices here, we find that here since my edge set is just 0 and 1 right. We try to look into what are the number of vertices here. Supposing the number of vertices is just 1, then I have 1 vertex right and on that vertex I have 2 edges 0 and 1 coming here but that gives me the full two shift. So, this is not equal to the this cannot generate my even uh, golden mean shift here. So, this is not a, so this possibility is anyway not possible. Then we try to look into what happens here is supposing we have two vertices. So, if we have two vertices here right there are two possibilities one possibility is because I have just two edges right. So, one possibility is 0 goes into 0 takes one vertex to one and one takes one vertex to the other, but this is a kind of a very useless shift nothing known there is no interaction between each other. The only points that can be generated will be the fixed point 0 the fixed six and sequence of zeros and sequence of ones right. So, this is anyway not my uh, golden mean shift at all right. So, this also does is does not give me my golden mean shift here. The other possibility that remains is I have two vertices and I have one edge say 0 going here and I have the second edge say 1 going here. Now, if I try to look into this aspect also right the only possible sequences we get here is 1 0 to the power infinity right the block 1 0 appearing itself and we get the block 0 1 appearing infinitely often these are the only two possibilities. So, this also does not give me the golden mean shift. So, basically when we talk of edge shift right every sub shift of finite type is not an edge shift, but there is a way how to do away with this particular problem and we shall discuss that in the next class.